Welcome to the final meeting of the Primary Health Care Special Interest Group today. Um, we're very fortunate to have with us today as speakers um, some of the founding members of the group and you'll be hearing what they have to say <laughs> about what they think has been happening over the last uh, 15 years shortly. So the first event of the group was held on the 15th of November 2001 when the speakers were Sandra Eldridge, Mike Campbell, Martin Underwood and Pat Udkin with chairs, the chairs were Tim Peters and Kerry and the group itself was formed in July 2002. Um, Tim was the chair for, from 2002 to 2009 and then Sandra took over as chair from 2009 to 2012 with Toby and Kerry being founding members of the group. Now I came on board as chair, uh, first of all as secretary in 2006, taking over from Sandra as secretary and Tim was then still the chair and then Morris took over as secretary from me from 2009 so he's been the longest serving secretary of the group so well done Morris <laughs> and I took over as chair in 2012. We've just been piecing all this together upstairs as we've been having our lunch. So now it's 2017 and it's 15 years later and we've held between 40 and 50 meetings over the last year, over the last uh, 15 years. Now um, this last year the Royal Statistical Society decided that study groups should only exist for one year. So we've done quite well to have been in existence for 15 years but our time is now coming to an end and this is our final meeting. So it's appropriate that Sandra and Kerry and Tim and Toby are here again today to speak to us um, as founder members. So before we start the meeting proper, um, I'd just like to thank um, all the committee members, past and present, all the chairs and secretaries, all our young um, committee members um, that have served on this committee over the past 15 years. So shall we thank everybody that's ever had anything to do with our <laughs> committee? <laughs> So I'm going to talk about um, progress in cluster randomised trials and I'm going to particularly think about the relationship with primary care um, because that's what this, this group was originally set up um, to focus on, on primary care and, and has done so. Um, I'm going to start with a very brief history um, of cluster randomised trials and then think about how they've developed over the past mm, half a century or so and what contribution primary care in particular has made to that. So I couldn't really speak at all without mentioning these two people, Everett Franklin Lindquist, um, who was the first person really to articulate um, the, the issues in cluster randomised trials uh, in, a, in a kind of research context, but that was in education. So many of the early, that was in the 1940s, many of the early cluster randomised trials were done in infectious diseases and um, one man in particular did quite a few of these, G.W. Comstock. He's, his life's work was really in tuberculosis and in the late 1950s he did four cluster randomised trials in Alaska looking at the prevention of tuberculosis. So that was the early days. Um, and there were not very many cluster randomised trials around then really until the late 70s. And in the late, what happened in the late 70s was um, there began to be interest in, more interest in research in chronic diseases and in particular in 1977 um, at the national meeting of the Society for Epidemiological Research there was a symposium on um, coronary heart disease and in that symposium they raised again the issues about cluster randomised trials and clustering in general. And as a result of that meeting, Cornfield, um, I couldn't find a picture of him actually, I really searched hard on the internet, I don't know what he looks like, I don't know if anybody else does. Um, anyway, he, he, he wrote this, and I think most of us who've been working in cluster randomised trials for some time will know this little quote, that randomisation by cluster accompanied by an analysis appropriate to randomisation by individual is an exercise in self-deception, however, and should be discouraged. Quite a, a famous quote, and I think we would all agree with that. So, so he was the first person to really point this out. Um, and then what happened? So 
Um, I think that probably many people in this room will be statisticians, so I'll have to do um, say um, something about this slide with caveats. I've done a really, really quick and dirty um, search looking at things with cluster random E, so it could be randomised with a Z or randomised with an S or whatever, um, in the title. And this is what I came up with. So I'm not necessarily suggesting that, it, that it, this is all cluster randomised trials, because particularly in the early days, I think the reporting wasn't very good and people didn't necessarily put cluster randomised anywhere where you could find it in their paper. And also some of these papers will be methodological papers. So um, I think there's probably an underestimate, particularly in the 1980s and 1990s, and I, I know that for a fact because I did a big review in the 1990s and I know there were more than about 22 trials, which is what you get with this search. Nevertheless, if you look at that graph, there is quite a phenomenal <coughs> increase. Um, so in, in 2000 to 2009, so over those, um, those years, there are, you get about 700 or so trials with this in the title, but in the last six years, or seven years since 2010, um, you get um, nearly 3,000. So we're still looking at a very rapid increase in these things. And if you think that I've massaged the figures at all, I also looked at it by year, although I, I haven't put that on the graph. So in 2011, there were only two, you could only find 250 trials or 250 studies if you did this sort of search, um, whereas this year, um, or last year, 708. So 708 trials with cluster randomised in the title. Having a quick look through, I think most of those are actually cluster randomised trials. There are a few methodological papers. So this is an area wh which is still rapidly increasing in terms of, of the number of trials done. And again, with a very quick and dirty search of, of primary care and various synonyms in the title and abstract, eight, at least 840 of those trials, and that's probably an underestimate, um, have been done in primary care. So that's about a quarter, maybe more, of cluster randomised trials in primary care. So that's the progress that there has been in the number of trials done. What about the progress in methodology? And I'm going to talk about that really in, in three um, sections. So if you look for methodology prior to 1990, um, almost all, or I think all the papers, will be authored or co-authored by Alan Donner, who obviously I have to mention if I'm talking about <laughs> cluster randomised trials, because he is the guru of cluster randomised trials. Um, and it's only really when you get to the turn of the century, as I, I love being able to live in an era when I can talk about the turn of the century and actually live through it, um, it's only when you get to the turn of the century that what you begin to get is more methodological papers by other people, but also you begin to get papers in the mainstream medical literature, and particularly uh, I would here mention Martin Bland and Sally Kerry. Sally was also a founder member of the primary health care um, special interest group, and their papers in both the BMJ and the British Journal of General Practice and Family Practice um, were really the first time people had started to talk about these trials um, and explain what they were about to a non-statistical audience. And about the same time, there were two books and an HTA um, monograph covering the same area. So around the turn of the century, you get a lot of um, people suddenly being interested in these types of trials. Beyond that, sort of from, I don't know, 2000 or five onwards, you get a great crowd of people now interested in the methodology of, of cluster randomised trials. Whether it's quite as many as in that crowd, I'm not sure, but there are an awful lot of people interested in the methodology of these trials. And more recently, there have been three books, and I think what's quite interesting is if you look at those books in comparison to the earlier books, the earlier books were sort of general books about this is the standard way that you treat a cluster randomised trial, and mostly about the statistical aspects about the design, about the analysis. The more recent books are either more focused or they cover other areas as well. So, for example, the one on the left in 2009, written by Richard Hayes and Larry Moulton, that really focuses on methods for these trials in low- and middle-income countries. Um, the one in the middle, which is one that I wrote with Sally and Kerry, that focuses on these trials in health services research, and we wrote that book specifically for non-statisticians. 
Um, so I don't know if statisticians probably read it as well, but we wanted to write a book that non-statisticians could also read and understand a bit about these trials. And it covers some of the areas that are not in, in standard statistical textbooks um, ab uh, about um, bias, about ethics, about reporting, etc. And the last book, 2014, um, and that was written jointly by Mike Campbell and Stephen Walters, and that um, covers uh, basically design analysis and reporting, and Mike Campbell was also a founding member of this group. So that third period, when we have a great crowd interested in these trials, has kind of covered, I think, the period um, of the primary health care special interest group. Um, and just to show you that, you know, we have been working over the years, I suddenly remembered today that we, I, I did have a picture of us, uh, we all, well, particularly me actually, I look a bit different, that is me on the left there, but you can see Tim and Morris and Raphael and I think that's Sarah Muller, yeah, yeah. Um, so we have been working away, that's one of our committee meetings in 2010. So I do apologise for the colours on this slide. I, I, th that's not the colours that I put in, but that's the way it's come out. Um, so what, what has all that methodol methodological work achieved? Um, I think um, what, what I emphasised is this three kind of periods of methodology. And in that middle period, around the turn of the century, I think there was a lot of um, dissemination of the ideas of cluster randomised trials out into the, the general um, research community. And if you look on the left... Um, you will see results from various reviews of cluster randomised trials. So this is people reviewing cluster randomised trials to look at their quality. And in the various reviews, you will see the blue, I think it is probably, little bars represent the proportion of trials in those reviews that are correctly accounting for clustering in the sample size calculation. And the strange looking purple bars are the proportion of cluster randomised trials in those reviews that are correctly accounting for analysis. What you will see is more people correctly account for clustering in the analysis than in the sample size, but on the left all those reviews include trials that were actually conducted or published rather between 1973 and 2002. If you look on the right, these are reviews where the trials were published between 1998 and 2009. And actually, you can see that there's been quite a substantial improvement, certainly in the proportion of trials um, accounting correctly for clustering in the sample size calculation and a smaller improvement um, in analysis. So we've achieved something, hopefully. Um, one of the things that, um, one of the ways in which people often think that um, something improves is through consort extensions. And I also have to say that I also think that because I've just led a consort extension that's just been published. So, so I, I do think that is the case. So the consort extension <coughs> probably had some influence on this, but you'll notice that, that the way I divided up those tri trials on the previous slide, the consort extension was not published. The first consort extension, there's been an update of that in 2012, but the first one was not published until 2004. So that's after a lot of this methodological work had actually taken place. And I think some of that early work um, did have an influence as well as the consort extension. So what's the contribution of primary care? And I don't want to over-egg the contribution of primary care. It could have been anything, but I think it happens to be primary care because that's where a lot of these trials um, were done. And there may be other reasons that you'd like to um, hypothesise about as to why uh, primary care has had a particular contribution. But in some of the examples and some of the methodological work that's been done, it is primary care which has been to the fore. And, and why, why is that? Well, one of the reasons, I think, is because using general practices, UK general practices, for example, as clusters, um, what you immediately face is that when you're recruiting patients from those clusters, you will have a variable cluster size because you haven't got the same number of patients, whatever you're looking at in each of the practices. And that led to work first done by Sally Kerry, and then Sally and I did some work together on um, how do you calculate sample size uh, for um, cluster randomised trials accounting for variable cluster size but it came out of the work that we were doing in primary care. The other thing that happens um, if you are using general practices as clusters is very often you will want to recruit individuals as they attend. So they might be attending for um, a particular um, issue at the practice and you want to recruit patients who have that particular condition, that particular issue. What that means is that you will be recruiting them after randomization. <laughs> 
Um, and that led to a recognition of the fact that this um, process of recruiting after randomization can sometimes lead to bias. Um, and the classic example of that, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment, um, is the uh, paper, um, the first author is Amanda Farin um, on the UK BEAM study, and I will talk about that in a moment. The other thing about um, doing cluster randomised trials in um, primary care is very often we're looking at chronic diseases, the management of chronic diseases, and what we're very often wanting to do um, is put in place interventions which will change professional practice. It's not like the early cluster randomised trials where they were looking at infectious disease. It's something a bit different. And if we put in interventions to change professional practice, um, we will have an intervention which is naturally aimed at professionals, not only at patients or the public. And one of the, th one of the um, things that I think that has influenced is uh, something which I also talk a little, a little bit more about in a moment, is the recognition those professionals are also, in a sense, participants in the trial. And that's sometimes a kind of grey area. They might be deliverers of part of the intervention to their patients, but they are also participants. So these are, these are three papers in those three areas. Um, and this is um, a graph taken from one of those papers which shows empirically the kind of variation that you get in cluster size in general practices. So it was the work that Sally and I then picked up on and, and um, <coughs> looked at whether we could um, look at this a bit more systematically to develop a method for people to use to estimate sample size if they had variable cluster sizes. So recruitment and randomization. So I'm going to talk about the UK BEAM um, study for those people who aren't aware of this issue, although I suspect that most people are. Um, so normally if we're recruiting into an individually randomized trial, we recruit a patient um, and we consent them and we randomize them and that's a kind of smooth sort of unified um, process. In a cluster randomized trial, it's not quite like that. We recruit our clusters somehow by going to somebody who's a representative um, for the cluster. Um, so we get some kind of cluster consent, and I've put that word consent in inverted commas because the Ottawa statement on the ethics of cluster randomised trials would now say you shouldn't really use consent in relation to a cluster, you should use agreement because they can't really consent on behalf of participants. But somebody there says, yes, our cluster will take part. So um, the next stage is very often randomising the clusters. Um, and so the participants cannot <coughs> consent to randomization, that's impossible. That um, consent to randomization is at the cluster level. What participants can consent to is to be part of um, whatever, whatever the intervention is. You can't force it on them, obviously, and they can consent to have their data collected. The problem is that if you do this in this order, um, you get bias. And the classic study, as I've said, is the UK BEAM study. So for those people who aren't aware of this, just to explain what happened in that study, um, they, they, they consented the clusters, they randomised the clusters, and then as people turned up, these clusters were general practices, as people turned up um, in the practices, they were recruited. And this was a study looking at back pain. So people who came into the surgeries with back pain were recruited into the study. So if you look at what happened in the study, in the control group, they, this was a pilot, fortunately. It wasn't the main study. Um, so they were able to change things, and they didn't do any cluster randomization in, in the main study. So in the control group, they only recruited 66 participants. And in the intervention group, they recruited 165. So far fewer than they wanted in the control group, and many more than they wanted in the intervention group. But in addition, those that they recruited in the intervention group were suffering from milder back pain. Um, and so the um, conclusion was that the offer of exercise classes, which was part of the intervention um, or physiotherapy, made the participa participation in the trial an attractive um, option, both for the professionals, they knew their, their patients were going to get something, and for the patients themselves, and therefore more people were recruited into the intervention arm. So what can you do about that? Well, the, uh, the one answer is to do this in the other order. So to make sure that you recruit um, participants before you actually do your randomization, then you don't have the problem. That isn't always possible. Um, and so 
Um, there's a series of papers on this, and these aren't the only ones, but the bottom two were ones that I published um, with various other people in the BMJ in, I can't remember when the first one is, but the second one is definitely 2009. And between those two papers, after the first paper, somebody in my department came up to me and said, it's all very well you always telling us what we do wrong. Um, why can't you tell us how to do it right? So the second paper was written um, in order to help people um, get through this issue of, of, of bias. Um, and if you do have to recruit individuals after you randomise the clusters, what are the possibilities for doing it? So um, the other thing that um, I, I mentioned on the slide where I showed you the three areas where I think primary care has had an influence was about the Ottawa Statement. For those people who don't know, the Ottawa Statement was published in 2012 and it's around the ethics of cluster randomised trials. It looked at these various questions, which I'm not going to go through in detail, and it's an awful lot of work. It was a major, major project done in Canada by um, a big research group who were able to get funding um, to do a substantial piece of work, which was, which was great. But one of the questions that they addressed was this issue of who is the research subject. And they came up with quite um, a, uh, a sort of um, an, an organised um, list of who is a, a research subject in a cluster randomised trial. And that it includes not only individual participants, patients, but it does also include, um, in some cases, the professionals who are involved in the trial. So um, just a little bit more on the contribution of primary care. One of the things about having a lot of trials in this area is, is obviously we've got a lot of data. Um, and so one of the things um, that has been done with that data is to look at patterns in intra-cluster um, correlation coefficients. Intra-cluster correlation coefficients is what you need at the beginning of your trial when you're doing your sample size. So there's been quite a lot of work looking at patterns in those, and particularly in primary care. Um, and thinking a little bit about the interventions as well, um, the interventions aimed often at um, professionals, as I've already said, but they're often aimed at changing organisation and changing practice. And therefore, one of the major reasons for cluster randomised trials in this setting um, is that it doesn't make sense to do it any other way. You actually can't do the trial any other way. And I think one of the things that um, this um, did was to make it clear to people that contamination, people often talk about um, one of the reasons for doing cluster randomised trials being contamination between individual patients. Um, and that was the case in some of the early trials in infectious diseases. That is the major reason for doing them. But now, within primary care and within um, other healthcare organisations and health services research, that is not. So I don't know whether you can see that very well, but this is just one example of, of um, a piece of research that has been done looking at patterns in intracluster correlation coefficients, which has been extremely helpful because anybody who's ever done a cluster randomised trial will know that you need some information on the intracluster correlation coefficient in order to do your sample size and where are you going to get that information from. In my view, the papers that have been done looking at patterns in intracluster correlation coefficients are much more useful than going searching for individual cor uh, intracluster correlation coefficients because if you go searching for an individual estimate, these things have massive sampling errors on them. So this is really, really useful work. So there's other developments which I haven't got time to talk about. Um, but one of the things that I did want to just touch on very, very briefly is step wedge designs, because nowadays you can't really talk about cluster randomised trials without doing so. So um, for people who don't know what step wedge designs are, this is where you take a cluster or a group of clusters, um, and so A, B, C, D, E are five clusters or groups of clusters, and then you have a lot of data collection points. Um, so here we've got six data collection points, and for the first data collection point, all your clusters or groups of clusters are in the control group. And then as you go through, your, um, your clusters move into the, the dark blue boxes. They move into the intervention group. So it's a more complicated design. It's a complicated form of, um, of uh, a cluster randomised trial. There are four stated advantages, at least in this paper, of, of um, step wedge design. I haven't got time to go through this in detail, but... My contention would be that um, some of these advantages um, are not really advantages because you can do these things just as well um, in an ordinary cluster randomised trial as you can in a step wedge design. However, there are some occasions in which, uh, in which step, step wedge designs are useful. 
But again, so I did this a little while ago for a different presentation, so it's just as quick and dirty search on step wedge designs. Um, so looking at um, from 2006 to 2015 at the number of empirical papers on the left and the number of methods papers on the right, um, you can see from a very low base in 2006, we've now in 2015 got about 40 um, step wedge designs published and 17 methodological papers. Um, I mean, my view on this, as I've, I've put on the, on the slide, is that maybe with step wedge designs, we are at the same stage of step wedge designs as we were with cluster randomised trials at the turn of the century. So what's happening is, is we know quite a lot about how to design, how to analyse these things, but some of the practical issues um, haven't yet really um, come to the fore and really been disseminated. And so the work on that, that, that bias issue that you get depending on the order in which you randomise and recruit people in a cluster randomised trials, the work on that didn't really start being published until about 2003. And I think we've got more publications to come out in terms of step wedge designs um, on practical issues. So conclusions, um, cluster randomised trials are still increasing in number. I was a little bit surprised when I, I looked at that search that they were increasing so much, but they are. And they're still very popular in primary care. I think there's these three periods of development that they went through. Um, and I think primary care has contributed to some of the key developments, partly because there's a lot of uh, trials done in that area. Step wedge trials are at an early stage of development. We've still got some of that practical, some of those practical issues to come out in terms of step wedge designs. And then I just put a little bit on the bottom there about my thoughts about where we might go in the future.